first uh, speaker, Professor uh, Kenichi Nishiyama. He's the professor and head of uh, neurosurgery at the University of Niigata. He is also very active in the International um, Neuroendoscopy Society. Professor Nishiyama, can I please invite you to um, deliver your lecture on endoscopy and vascular anatomy? Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. So, dear all, Jim, passing one year ago, it was a sad and difficult time for all of us. Today, everyone will reflect on his extraordinary but wonderful life and his many brilliant achievements. <coughs> Education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. That is the word from by the Nelson Mandela. As all you know, Jim traveled all over the world and gave his extensive knowledges and experiences geniusly to everyone. Those are not only neurosurgery, but also culture, history, and many things related to human life. I always thought that his talk is truly the education for doctors and nurses having people's lives in their hands. Well, for me, the first time to meet uh, Jim was in Berlin more than 10 years ago. He made a very pleasant harmony with my friend Hannes Haber. He left a good memory in me. So for me, he was not merely neurosurgeon at first time. He was, he was a man of culture. <coughs> this is a nice book he wrote, Collection of Medical Instrument and Ephemera. In this catalog, all Japanese books on medicine and science are introduced. Additionally, he takes up Japanese samurai sword. It's amazing for me. He really interested in intercultural exchange and lab learning about new culture. The Japanese sword is main weapon and symbol for samurai. A man's honor was set to reside in this samurai sword. And the samurai stands for a person who protects someone like a knight in Western countries. The sword of samurai is called Bushido and the virtues of Bushido include justice, courage, sympathy and affection uh, for the others and politeness, truthfulness, honor and loyalty. I think Jim had a deep respect for the samurai spirit rather than us Japanese. He was truly samurai. You know, he is not sleeping. I think he is thinking about something like a samurai. I'm very lucky because having opportunity to enjoy education with Jim. And uh, this is uh, his lecture in Japan. And uh, always his lecture is careful and easy to understand and everyone trains, every train is a facility to these lectures, okay? So he sometimes traveled to Asia and deepened friendship with friends in Asian countries. We had a good time that we will never forget. So I decided today's my talk to the basis of endoscopic surgery for hydrocephalus that I teach with Jim to beginners and young neurosurgeons, sometimes elsewhere in hands-on workshop. The title is the vascular anomaly and uh, sorry, vascular anatomy, an <coughs> anatomy and possible complications of the endoscopic surgery for pediatric hydrocephalus. Uh, currently, many lesions and pathological conditions can be treated with neuroendoscope. Now, ETV is one of the basic procedures among that, and it is very popular for pediatric neurosurgeons. But complications of ETV could happen. The overall, overall rate was uh, uh, 8.5%. When we think about intraoperative complications, we have to avoid vascular damage because it causes serious intraventricular hemorrhage or subarachnoid hemorrhage. Basic approach in ventriculoscopic surgery is from anterior position, probably right frontal horn. 
When he introduced the scope into the anterior horn, he, usually we see the forearm in the mono and cord plexus here, and also some ependymal veins, that is the uh, uh, anterior septal vein, and uh, there's an term straight vein, and also the anterior caudic vein. Here in January, general, the uh, term straight vein runs along stereothermic sulcus here, and it makes some connections to superficial medullary vein and related to the, uh, sorry, uh, <coughs> Super major vein and reflux in the body. If you injure this vein, venous infarction of the basal ganglia will be complicated. This anterocorded vein runs deep in this part and related to the uh, internal capsule, the genuine internal capsule. And these veins have to be protected, of course, and additionally, it is considered as good anatomical landmarks especially in anomaly cases. With usage of cadaver, the opening of the colloidal fissure has been extended background from, from the foramen of monolo to expose internal cerebral vein, ICV, and uh, major posterior colloidal artery causing in the bedroom interpositum. The term straight vein, uh, the curved medullary here, like and becomes the ICB at the posterior margin of the foramen of Monlo. This U-shaped junction uh, is called venous angle. In some cases, term street vein is changing the term coded vein is thick rather than term street vein and uh, directly runs to the ICB. And the anterior vein here, it causes majorly from the tip of the frontal horn and the curved posteriorly along the septum pericidum and column phonics, then passed above the foramen of molar to join ICB. Location of anterior septal vein and ICB junction features certain variations. The group of Dr. Alumefti and Yasadu classified the variation into four types, and the most common type was that the junction was located at the venous angle, which lies adjacent to the posterior margin of the foramen of Monlo. So to avoid the venous hemorrhage from this junction, we sometimes choose the septostomy rather than foramen of the Monlo. When you manipulate in the lateral ventricle, we should know paraventricular venous system in detail, depending on the approaches to avoid serious venous injury. Three, uh, uh, these, there, are, there, there are two groups medial group and lateral group, as you can see in the slide. And these veins are connected to deep venous systems such as ICV. This video shows the uh, ETV with removal of all the shunt. It suggests that how understanding anatomy of paraventricular vein is important for us. In this way, the uh, Operator tried to remove the catheter, but the catheter adhered to some tissues, probably the choreplexus. He pulled it forcibly and inserted a cyst, but as you know, the blood is CSF got out. So when you insert the endoscope, we cannot identify anything, any normal structure, but like uh, there's a membrane, maybe, maybe the choreplexus or hemorrhage, so we change the ETV to the removal of hematoma. So after removal of the hematoma like this, finally we can see there are some structures, but at that time here, so normal venous anatomy became hint to understand it. In this case, posterior margin of the foramen the monolo was broken and also the anterior vein was broken at this venous point. So, uh, Understanding anatomy of paraventricular vein is very important and uh, uh, we have to do it before the operation. So, okay, let's consider ETV. From anatomical perspective, venous angle, this is the part of uh, pay attention in ETV because the during manipulation in the third ventricle, we cannot look this area. So sometimes the shaft of the scope attaches rub and push this area and finally induce a venous hemorrhage in here. 
And after perforation of the third ventricle floor, you can see the vasculature in the cistern like this. But you should mention about that the vasculature just on the third ventricle floor are often hidden by the thick membrane of mesencephalic leaf or the, uh, the, the uh, lytic membrane like this. In the interpedancular cistern, of course, that is the uh, space under the third ventricle floor, there are some important vessels, as you can see here in slides. Uh, the arteries penetrate the posterior uh, perforated substances, these three vessels, and also the, the uh, uh, posterior thermic perforated paramedian thermic arteries and paramedian mesencephalic arteries. These arteries basically from the top of the budget artery or the PCA. And when you see the lateral side, the pre-mammaries from PCOM or lungs. And of course, we have to avoid injury these arteries as well as the budget artery. This is a case of a two years old boy. Uh, he presented delay in speech and macrocephaly and the MRI and the CT shows the membrane of uh, obstruction of the outlet of foramen, the outlet of fourth ventricle. And we try to ETB. This is the membrane obstruction of the outlet of fourth ventricle. And so we, oh, sorry. I use the electrocoagulate manipulate in this ETB. So the arterial bleeding was happening maybe the front branches of the budget artery. I don't like this Japanese flag, so the, uh, this operation is also changing from ETB to the uh, evacuation of hematoma in this case. Uh, he was lucky the boy was inside in shunt and keep good condition until now. He is very lucky and uh, any uh, aneurysm was uh, detected in this boy. So according to the literature, almost all the cases with budget artery injury, the bleeding will stop during some minutes, maybe the 20 to the 40 minutes or so. Uh, our case is at 25 minutes. So and the operation can be finished and the patient can be out from the OR. However, as a complication after procedure, as I said, uh, should aneurysm was detected and ruptured in some cases. When you look at the instrument of the perforation as ETB, electrocoagulate ones were used in some cases. So I emphasize that how to do following injury of basal artery, at first, calm down and keep a drainage route from the ventricle and control ICP and the continuous irrigation maybe with prey and wait until completion of hemostasis and never doing blood manipulation to avoid injury of normal structures. This is very important. And also follow-up images to detect the traumatic aneurysm is essential. And how to avoid basal artery injury. Uh, I, I emphasize that analysis of the anatomical structures in the cistern before ETB is very important. Maybe with the usage of high resolution MR images, such as face or cyst, and also, sometimes we have to change to extraventricular shunt or endoscopic aqueduct plasty in a case with high risk. And blunt perforation and the careful dilatation with the balloon is very important. Okay, the vascular anomaly in is very important, not only ETV, as an, another technique of the making bypass between the ventricle and cistern. I'll talk about temporal ventricostomy and also the cistern in the quadrigeminal cistern. I prefer the temporal ventricostomy in a case with trapped inferior horn like this. It makes a communication between the ventricle and the cistern directly. When you insert the endoscope in the inferior horn, you can see the colloidal point at first. And I, I, I always did, I moved the endoscope to anterior and laterally, and at that time, I perforate here. So, this one, 
In here, as I said, before I, and under the label, the coil fissure is a safe point. I'll show you uh, from now on. And tube stenting I use, and this, uh, maybe the stent placement is essentially in temporal ventricular stomach. So with this procedure, ventricular, we open to the uh, interpedancular system or crural system. In this area, we have to mention about the damage, of course, to the oculomotor nerve and also posterior colloidal artery and its branches. And the injury of anterior colloidal artery have to be avoided too. The anterior colloidal artery passes around the upper medial part of the anus to reach the inferior horn and they enter the colloidal plexus at the, at the, at the uh, Sylvian point. And furthermore, P2 causes major to the uncus in, uh, in the crural system. To avoid these important vascular structures, I make fenestration at the point of anterolaterally from the corridor point. But of course, in some cases, the ventricle is very big and expanded so large. So sometimes the ventricle was very thin. At that time, I perforate a very thin wall. Okay. Next topic is yeah, arachnoid cyst in quadrigaminal system. Yeah, it is one of the best indications for the uh, endoscopic ventricular system stomach, I think. I use the flexible scope always, so basically I prefer the approach from anterior horn and penetrate, sorry, penetrate the medial wall of lateral ventricular body close to the trigon. And uh, I think checking the location of deep veins uh, before surgery is important for safe operation. And I always examine high resolution MRI of these coronary images. Check the coiled plexus like this and ICV like this and this. So, and sometimes also basal vein and then decided to the entry point into the quad, uh, gamer system. Regarding anatomy in this system, ICV and uh, medial atrial vein could be blind spot of endoscopic view during this approach. Injury of these veins causes subarachnoid hemorrhage and serious venous infarction, so we have to avoid that. When you successfully introduce the endoscope, we can look the uh, ipsilateral side of the basal vein of Rosenthal. This is another successful case, and in this case, Superior, sorry, superior cerebellar veins was revealed for incomplete cyst fenestration. And of course, the approaches from the third ventricle side is another choice. But if you become familiar to this approach, entering quadrigaminal system from the lateral ventricle side, you can apply this technique to treatment of isolated force ventricle. The stenting between third and fourth ventricle be at the quadrium system. But um, actually, I think aqueduct plasty with stent is more popular and safe. And uh, it's, it's, it's uh, maybe the, a standard technique, but this could be one of the outer procedure in the case with isolated fourth ventricle. Okay, from now, uh, this is the Easter talk. This is an infantile case with congenital hydrocephalus due to aqueduct stenosis, and we've done ETB, but postoperative CT scan revealed deformity of the cranium, intraparenchymal, intraventricular hemorrhage, and subdural hemorrhage. According to the previous report, the 143 ETB were performed in pediatric cases. This is the, uh, uh, the uh, paper from Dr. Navarro. Uh, in this case, the two of the 12 complications were subdural hematoma and intraventricular hematoma, and both cases were under one year of age. So I consider that a possible mechanism on, in these conditions that follows, since immature fusion of the skull and fragile brain parenchyma specific in infancy, acute loss of CSF during endoscopic surgery, causes collapse of the cranium and the brain, brain shrinkage. Those induce injury bridging vein and brain parenchymal damage. In some cases, return of the deep vein is disturbed. So 
finally subdural hematoma or uh, intraparenchymal hematoma or intraventricular hemorrhage are complicated. So anyway, I want to emphasize that control of ICP and water balance are essential during endoscopic procedure for hydrocephalus in a small child, especially in a small infant. Okay, as a summary of this talk, I send my take home message as follows. That is, we need to understand more about anatomy of paraventricular veins, deep venous system and arteries in the system. And we need to keep drainage route from the ventricle to control ICP and water balance during the endoscopic procedure for pediatric hydrocephalus. Thank you. And this is one of my talk when I had a time to enjoy the hands-on workshop with Dr. Gulich. We miss Jim, but I never forget good memories and he lives eternally in our heart. I believe he's always watching over us from heaven. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Nishiyama, uh, that uh, excellent and very pertinent uh, lecture. I've got a question for you from uh, Dr. Mr. Kaliya Perumul. Uh, he's consultant in Edinburgh. He's asking you uh, if you do endoscopic uh, fenestration of arachnoid cyst and if it recurs, at what point you will convert, uh, you will resort to uh, inserting a shunt? Arachnoid uh, cyst in, I think the, uh, in maybe the, for me, they are almost all the cases. I, I can do it in uh, an endoscopic approach. But I think that is there. Uh, and to depend on my experience. So if you see the, uh, uh, some small vessels and when you touch the vessels, maybe sometimes the small bleeding is happen. So at that time, sometimes I change the shunt. But uh, in... Uh, Almost cases, I can stop the hemorrhages in the small hemorrhage. So this time, I, I don't have uh, many times, so I cannot explain. But uh, we have to must uh, we have to be, uh, learn about uh, how to stop stop the small hemorrhage. But in other breathing, we cannot do anything in uh, endoscopic surgery. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I think. Um, Dr. Kaliparamal, he was also alluding to if the endoscopic fenestration of arachnoid cyst hadn't been successful or it had recurred again, would you uh -huh. retry the endoscope or would you go at that point to put a shunt? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, uh, I don't like shunt. I don't like shunt. So I, I doing the second and the third fenestration, maybe sometimes with usage of the stenting. Yes, because the, in the physiological CSF uh, flow is very important rather than shunt. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Nishiyama. 